Thank you, Jonah, for stepping in there. I um, I owe you one next time I see you. Um, uh, I should have predicted that would happen. That a, a use really useful application would have been blocked by our internal uh, IT services. So apologies for the delay. So I'll start again. Um, um, so when we're awarded the uh, the HLF um, uh, funding, um, we knew this wasn't just a five-year delivery sort of period. Um, we thought this would be um, the start of a movement forward for change in the rivers, um, particularly the Little Loons, which I'm going to uh, focus on today. And it's going to bring in sort of new color, um, collaborations, new partnerships, um, new funding streams, new partners funding, uh, new opportunities, um, hopefully new groups are arise from it. So at the end of the delivery period, the five year delivery period, we're, we're stronger and we're moving forward with even more sort of restoration and more schemes and more, um, and more change. Um, and hopefully the, the rivers will, will be healthier. Um, so I'm, in, I'm employed by the environment agency to, um, to, to deliver projects. Um, and I'm just focusing on the Little Oos and Brandon Staunch today because it's the first project uh, we're delivering and um, we're currently constructing it. Um, okay, so the first slide, please. Sorry, I can't see my slides, Lindsay. <laughs> Jesse. Can everyone else see the slides? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, right. Um, sorry, James, do you want to talk to your slides? And I'll try yeah, and make sure yeah, that yeah. I'm yeah. <laughs> following you. Following you. So, so we're on background. Hopefully, you can see that. Yeah. Yes. Um. So the Little Ooze is obviously a chalk stream. Next. Um, it's heavily modified throughout its catchment, and this is because of uh, navigation um, through uh, milling, through land drainage. Next. Um, so the catchment is mainly rural. Um, we've got a large part of the catchment is uh, the forest. Um, a lot of the riparian area around the river in the catchment is um, sort of set aside grazing. Um, it's, it's good to see that not, there's not farming right up to the, um, or arable farming right up to the uh, side of the river. Um, next. Um, and in the catchment we've just got one large conurbation which is uh, Fetford and then the rest of them are sort of small villages or smaller sort of towns. Um, so the EI, EA identified Brandon Staunch as uh, a priority barrier because um, uh, it's the first on in the river on the Little Ooze. Um, and in, it's also a priority from the sort of fishery survey data that we have taken upstream of uh, Brandon Staunch. And also we were getting reports from um, anglers uh, catching sea trout or trout. Um, below the staunch. Unfortunately, we never had any scales taken, um, so we don't know if they were sea trout or wild trout or whether they're sort of stockies that come, come down or come from somewhere. And, and also there's no connectivity. So we've got this great reservoir of the uh, um, sort of the south level system, the EDUs, the CAM, and you know, there's thousands of acres of water there with great coarse fishing. Um, but because of the structure of Brandon, there's no way of them moving upstream if they wanted to. So it's completely cut off from course fish. And again, in uh, sort of flood flows, um, there's the possibility of the reach being devoid of juvenile course fish being you know, swept into the EU system and no way of them returning to the, the reach upstream of Brandon Storm. So it was a priority for us. Uh, next. So the EA carried out a um, feasibility study in uh, 2013 of, sort of various options of Brandon Staunch. And um, so we looked at sort of barrier removal, um, natural uh, bypass channel, which is great because it creates you know, you know, valuable um, habitat. 
Um, and it also uh, allows more of the smaller core species and juvenile species to pass the structure. But Brandon, it's, it's pretty tight on space there because of sort of um, land ownership and other sort of recreation opportunities. Uh, and it, and it technically, technically it wouldn't work because the, the, the natural bypass channel wouldn't come in anywhere near the structure. So it would be likely that it wouldn't be a, a fishing because the fish wouldn't find it. They'd be attracted to the main the main storage. Um, so at the end of that, we because we had to keep sort of navigation there, and, and we've got a great uh, head of water, and it's controlled well by the the sluice gate on the staunch. Um, we decided that a Lorinier fish pass was the best option, so it's a single flight Lorinier fish pass. Next. Um, so during the um, uh, the initial sort of HLS planning. Phase, we uh, funded an outline design of a Lurian fish pass and, um, and we've come up with a design that's 1.8 metres wide and it's about 10 metres long and it's got an eel pass as well. Next, so the construction started in January 2021 and it's part funded by the HLF. So next, so we should be on the slide that says wider catchment. Yes. So, um, just the sort of background of the, the the sort of the wider catchment and sort of how migratory fish would get to uh, the Little Lou's at Brandon. Um, so, fish, uh, uh, sea trout, and eels would come in through the water through Kings Lynn. Um, we've got a big structure there um, called the tail sluice, and this is quite passable to a lot of species. So, we're catching sea trout in the relief channel. Again, these are reports uh, from fishermen who've taken scales for us and they're also, we found them in our fishery survey. So there's a good number of uh, migratory species making it in for that structure. We've also got an eel pass there. Uh, next, so we've got Denver Little Eyes, which is another um, uh, tidal structure, which uh, lets our water from the EUs and CAM, as well as the Wissi and the Lark um, and other tributaries into the tidal river. Um, this is a little more, um, uh, bit more difficult for sort of fish species to pass this structure just because of the head of water. So there's a very small window and the fish would have to be, you know, it's the, it's the greatest sort of uh, swimming speed sort of fish um, or, or sea trout. So we think only that the biggest trout would make it through, through, that, um, through that structure. Um, and we've got an eel pass there as well. Um, so back in 2015, we installed a uh, two-flight Lorinier uh, at, at Denver, um, and this connects up the relief channel with the, the EUs of the South Level System. And within 24 hours of switching that on, uh, we had distant cameras and we were seeing fish uh, and eels moving uh, through the structure. So next, so we should be on a slide saying Brandon Staunch. Yes. So uh, Brandon Staunch is uh, EA lock. Um, it's a sluice gate, so it controls uh, the level in, in flood flows, and, and there's also a weir. And on the weir, there's an old sort of uh, canoe portage from the 1980s that's um, now uh, restricted for use because it's not safe. Um, and it's um, it's completely impassable to fish, um, apart from. Flooding. So this is this this January. Um, so we had flooding throughout the catchments, and this is sort of what brand looked like. And so you know, strong sea trout would easily go for that. But coarse fish again, there would be uh, um, there would be strong enough swimmers. Uh, it would be you know, elvers and eels aren't migrating this time of year upstream, so it would be impossible to to them too. So it's roughly about a one point. Uh, sorry, uh, next and next. So. Uh, so there's a roughly about a 1.2 meter head, um, which makes it impassable. Next, uh, next. So um, the Lorinia fish pass 1.8 meters wide. Uh, it's set within its own uh, channel now, uh, and it will have its own uh, weir um, cast, which is about a new 15 degree um, uh, percent uh, weir. And on the side of it, there'll be an eel and a Rene, uh, pass. Next. So that should just be a side profile of the, uh, 
the new fish pass and and, and how it uh, how it binds into the new sort of uh, the, the old yeah. next. So it should be on the slide saying construction. Um, so we started the fourth of the first, uh, 2021, and the river was currently in flood, and um, we thought it was going to go down, um, which has always happened on record. Uh, the last time it flooded there was um, 15 years ago, and we needed to open the lock for a couple of days, and it, it just kept on coming. So next, and kept on coming, and uh, the the... the the lock was open for discharge and the gate was open for discharge for over four weeks. Um, and when, once they uh, sort of, you know, eventually were shut down and the, the sluice gate was open, the flows were were still too strong. It was just unprecedented and, you know, we never knew that it was just going to continue um, uh, throughout the winter like that. And I think the, um, the flows were... 247% above the sort of long term average or something like that. So it was just a crazy amount of water. And there's still a lot of water out there now, seeing it in fields and ditches and, and sort of springs coming coming out the side of the sort of hillside. So there's still a lot of water around now and above what it would have been in previous years. So next. So the progress so far. Um, so we started work. Um, uh, this slide is uh, us setting in the uh, coffer dam, we're putting some extremely long piles in there. Um, and this is to dry the weir out so we can start construction. Next. So this slide is uh, inside the coffer dam. So this is it's still wet, so they're just, uh, they're still setting the coffer dam in, in this sort of slide. Um, but you can see the weir there, it's too steep for any sort of fish pass and you can see the old canoe steps there. Next. So this is it all dried out, so we're in the dry now. The pumps uh, drain it down every morning. Um, the pumps go off at nine, it floods, and it, 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 stops, um, it stops any sort of people climbing into the structure um, at night, um, because we are having people sort of break into the site. So next, so this is a, just a shot of the, uh, the guys wiring up. So we've started to wire up and we're pouring concrete. So we're actually at the construction uh, sort of stage and we're not mobilizing or uh, demolishing anymore. So we're actually moving forward. Next. Um, so this is a, a finished Lurinier. So sort of, it'll be sort of slightly bigger than that, slightly longer than that, uh, with a, an eel sort of Lurinier um, lamprey tiles next to it. Um, and we're hoping to, to complete uh, uh, by the end of May, so we should have been constructed by now because of the sort of the delays. Um, um, with, we we are going to be finishing in May. So next, so the little ooze catchment. So next, so there's six barriers on the little ooze. Um, Brandon, uh, Abbey Heath, Fletcher Number One. Uh, then you've got the Pod Mill side sluices, uh, Gaging Station at Ooston, and then a Gaging Station at Nettleshaw. Um, Brandon will be fully fish, fish passable uh, and eel passable. Um, Abbey Heath has got an eel pass at the moment, and Fetford number one has got an eel and fish pass, but the fish pass uh, isn't working very well. Uh, so there's uh, four barriers on the FET as well. Um, so after Fetford number one, you've got um, you've got mill in uh, Fetford, uh, Fetford Coffee Mill, sorry. Uh, Melford Gaging Station, uh, Bridgham Gage Station, and then East Harling. Um, and all of these currently are impassable. Uh, and also the Little Ouse, uh feeds the, the Saffistons. So we've got a, a few gaming stations on the Saffistons and a few uh, private structures as well there. So next. So the ill pass is already, uh, already in place in uh, at two sites. Next, um, next. So Abbey Heath is uh, relatively easy to install a fish pass here. Um, next. Um, so the options here are low cost baffles. Um, it's relatively low cost, quick to deliver. So once uh, Brandon's sort of finished, we'll be looking to secure the funding um, to deliver this sort of phase of the. Uh, project to, to get fish, whether they're migratory or coarse fish, upstream towards Thetford. Next. 
Um, next. So Fetford number one, uh, it's got an ill pass there. It's, this picture, is, it's, got, it's, it's all clogged up with vegetation, but it's it's fine. It doesn't stop an ill passage or other passage upstream. The fish pass isn't very effective. Um, and we've got some options in our head that we can do there. We need to speak to partners and get partnership funding. There's really good opportunities to, to make a feature of a, a natural bypass channel within sort of the, the park in Thetford. Um, it would create gap habitat, it would be great for sort of visual amenity, um, but we'd need to work with partners to, to deliver that. So next, so problem size, size solutions. Um, so this is the end of its life. Um, it's an EA structure that we're looking to replace. So at that point, we will include uh, fish and eel passage in that structure. Um, and that's sort of the key structure for getting the, uh, sort of getting fish upstream. Um, so last year on the fair, we had a breach in Fetford. Um, oh, it might have been uh, 2018 actually, or 2019, sorry. Um, so again, it's uh, the, the, the water course was changed um, uh, for milling uh, and it was moved to higher ground. So the surrounding ground, like a lot of our sort of rivers now, um, is lower. So the, the river is basic visit is trying to get back to the paleo channel because you know that's where the water wants to push so it pushed through the bank there it bypassed it into a into a sort of a ditch um uh so we've got funding this year to to put in a um, structure there to sort of throttle the water so it's not overcharged and it will become a a really nice sort of natural um, sort of stream and um we're already sort of seeing great features there It'll also become a fish pass around coffee mill um, and allow fish passage upstream uh, for um, migration species and coarse fish. So next, so we should be on the slide saying restoration work. So next, so we've uh, we've got ten sites that have undergone improvements in sort of the last ten years on on the on the Little Ooms. Um, these have mainly been delivered by the Environment Agency, so we've, we've got quite a few around um, Sands and Downham. Um, we've got some uh, below Abbey Heath. Um, we've got some uh, by the BTO um, near Thetford. Um, so we've got a bypass channel, so we've done some digging dump work there. Um, Rushbrook, we did some uh, digging dump there, and also Nettles through Heath, Heath, we've done uh, digging dump. Next. Um, so, although fish passage doesn't, you know, um, improve the river, um, it, it sort of drives more restoration. So, what as the sort of uh, fish passage um, carries on up the river, we can then find more opportunities to uh, improve restoration. And as they're sort of planned, we can plan them beforehand. Um, as long as they're not structure removals. Next. Um, so we're hoping that, you know, by the end of the delivery period that these sort of structures I've, I've been talking about now are um, either happened or in fruition, then we've got the funding sort of guaranteed. And that opens up, you know, more conversations with landowners, other groups, and more partnership opportunities. Um, and we're hoping, you know, um, all these uh, measures we're putting in, um, although they're not solely contributing to a healthy river, um, they're helping towards deliver that, and that's sort of the end goal. Um, and, you know, like we've already had a restocking um, um, of the, the FET this year, and we've been restocking with dace and other species uh, on the litter loos. So we're hoping that all this work sort of comes together and at the end, it, we end up with a healthier river. <coughs> Sorry, next. We should have the last night now, which is any questions. Thank you very much, James, for that presentation. For that presentation. Yeah, so I, I should have... Had I known I would have changed the presentation so it was more easier to follow, but I did think I was going to be presenting it myself. So sorry if we're a bit behind on slides or anything like that. Hopefully I tracked you all right so everyone saw the pictures. Right. <laughs> <laughs>
I'm getting double feedback, getting so double feedback, Sam, so could you do the Q&A? Sam, can you do the Q&A? I can do. I can do. I think I might need to go between James and himself, and then we've asked the question. Yeah, sorry, James, yeah, that's, um, sorry, James, that's when we have you online, we, we go, online, me and Sam, double talk. <laughs> right, OK. So I'm just going to just mute you while I ask the question and then I'll ask you to come off mute to answer them. Sorry about that. Um, so the first um, question is from Alan Woods. What are the reasons behind it taking eight years from an option study to implementation? Was it simply funding or are there structural or systemic blockers um, in EA or other bodies that slow the process down? How can we speed up implementation of great initiatives like this? Um, blocker passes needed to enable fish passes. So that's, I'll, I'll go on mute now and let you come off and answer that. We've, we've got you on mute, James, if you wouldn't mind. Yeah, yeah, thank you, Alan. Um, so, um, so partly funding, um, so we're waiting for the partnership funding, um, which was the HLF um, funding, um, which we got last year. Um, so we could have started last year, which would have taken a year off, but obviously there's a pandemic, so that slowed everything down. Um, and then there was the delivery period, which was the outline design. So again, this was, uh, we, we were, you know, working with uh, Suffolk CC during the delivery period, um, which then fed on to sort of this sort of um, um, being awarded the HLF. So there was, between outline design and, and construction, there was, there was quite a long period. Um, before that, we, we didn't have any sort of funding uh, allocated, so we needed the partnership element. Um, so I hope that... The blockers, so talking about the blockers, um, the, the blocking is is a long process of uh, feasibility design and construction, but the block is finding that partnership funding or, you know, funding in total from the EA. Um, so it, it depends on what sort of streams of money we find as well, so whether we need that partnership funding to, to guarantee the EA funding as well. So um, that's why it took so long. Thank you very much, um, James. Uh, I've got two, I'll give you two questions um, so that you can, you can go from one to the other. So the first question is, are you consulting or liaising with leisure groups on river restoration or passes? And um, the second question was, how much of this upgrade was driven by eel regulation issues, if any? Uh, so, um, so with the pass at um, Brandon, we would like to make um, uh, open to sort of canoes. At the moment, there's um, um, there's a canoe portage you get out of your, your boat and you sort of carry it through. But we're still sort of in discussion with that um, internally whether it's safe to allow that to happen. Um, also, we've gone over budget because of sort of the flooding and some other factors. So um, it would mean trying to find some extra funding to, to make some changes to make it safe. And sort of kind of it. Um, regards to the restoration work, um, we, we we have cons well can cons have consulted with us because um, I know some are, uh, are worried about trees being felled and stuff like that in the river. Um, which I've previously sort of mentioned in some of the um, the FDR presentations that they've actually fallen down. They're with wind blowing, so it's up to the landowners to uh, uh, to remove them. So they're not well, they're not trees we're dropping in the river to uh, for restoration. They're, they're just naturally come down, um, and um, and obviously we're we're consulting with sort of angling groups as well. And the second one was the eel reg. So yeah, it'd be really easy if it was just the eel regs actually, because we would have delivered it years ago and it'd be really cheap. Um, but it's, uh, it's not just about the eels on that side, it's about, of course, fish and migratory species uh, 
uh, sea trout as well. So we wanted to do the, the whole lot in one go. It would be more efficient doing it like that as well. So that's what we're waiting. Thank you. So um, the the next point to mention is you've got lots of comments from people saying it sounds it looks like really great work and people are um, keen to stay in touch and hear more about the project um, and seeing some more results once the pass is finished. So that's just a, a comment really. And then a question is how much do you have to deal with public opposition and misunderstanding of what you're trying to achieve? How much can you just allow rivers to take their own path? So that's from Teresa for you, James. Yeah, I'll, I'll just add that if you go onto the BFDR uh, website and go onto their Facebook page, uh, they're, they're sort of posting updates of the uh, the fish pass. So that at the moment they've got a really nice video of um, uh, a, a drone flying over the site, uh, and we're also taking a time lapse time lapse of the the whole project. So um, you'll be able to uh, see the construction in process. You'll be able to see the people breaking into the site as well. So. Uh, um, but yeah, um, so yeah, we, that, that, you know, that's in, in all projects and, and um, um, obviously after this winter, um, we're getting a lot of sort of uh, consultation or, or, or complaints, uh, misconceptions about the rivers should be, you know, they should be dredged, you know, all, all the trees should be removed. Um, and even where it's not affected, you know, obviously there's a difference where it's affected in properties, uh, flooding properties, um, you know, where it's flooding farmland or footpaths, people are expecting us to, to dredge the, the rivers so they're sort of dry. So there's a lot of sort of misconception there um, to keep the water out of the floodplain, and that's done by dredging. But, you know, the water we saw over Christmas, it, it doesn't matter what we did, it would still come out of bank, it would still go in the floodplain because of the volume of the water. Um, I can't, sorry, I can't remember what the first part of the question was, so I'll just read it. Um, it was about the, how much you have to deal with public opposition. Yes, so there's not much opposition actually on, on this scheme, it's quite straightforward, because um, it's, it's an EA structure, um, we're not changing the water levels. Um, we've had to close the bridge, because the bridge over structure is, um, uh, right, it goes right into construction work. So there's been a bit of opposition because of that, because it, it blocks a nice circular walk, uh, and we've been locked down. So people have wanted to walk around the river and they haven't been able to do. Um, but yeah, that site's um, it's not really sort of contentious. They're sort of contentious where we where we've got sort of structures that need removing um, or historic structures that, that that need removing. So there's another group that you know, want us to keep those structures. Um, and it's hard, it's um, it's like delivering Brexit, you know, you can't deliver Brexit and keep everyone happy, because um, everyone wants something different out of it. So um, there's, you know, obviously you've got canoeists want something different to the fishermen, uh, the fishermen want something different to uh, the conservationists. Uh, so it's really, it's a real hard balance to sort of uh, sell some of the projects because there's going to like there's going to be opposition to elements of it, uh, and you know sometimes you, you just cannot work um, a design to keep everyone happy. Thank you. And then the final um, two points were about um, was this part of the Fen Edge project, and a second request for more publicity and explanation, the ability to look up. Um, what is happening. I think that's been partially answered by your points about um, um, the, the page that Sam Westford has shared um, with everyone on the chat. So you can look at the BFER website that James um, mentioned, but I'll just let you come in, James, if you want to add anything to, to either of those points. Yeah, sorry. So the HLF funding BFER project is part of the uh, Fenage the Benage project, which is uh, the Heritage Lottery Funding Project, uh, which is delivering um, projects throughout the Fen, so uh, the Wissy, the Little Ouse, the Lark, um, in the next sort of five years or four years, because it will stop the year. So. 
Well, thank you very much, James, for, for that great presentation. And it's um, really good to see the, the pictures as well as the, the description. So I appreciate you making the effort to share that presentation with us. Um, and thank you everyone to your to your patience while, while we bed with that as well. So um, really appreciate that. We will um, obviously go through this, this chat um, as well for anything that may have been missed and all of the good points following the Anglian Water session as well that I can see have been coming in. But thank you, James. All right, um, that takes us to the close of the conference. Um, I don't have any slide for this, but we just wanted to say um, a, a huge um, um, yeah, great gratefulness from us, really, from the presenters to prepare those slides for us and to share those cameo projects, successes and, and key priorities going forward. So we're really looking forward to seeing what what the projects deliver and really importantly, the areas for partnership opportunities, which I think everyone can agree are, are tremendous from from generally, but also from coming out from the call yesterday and today. Um, as Cameo hosts, we look forward to working with you on the Cameo partnership, as we spoke about this morning. And um, we will be sharing information about all the projects that were talked about today, because it sounds like there's um, a, a lot of further conversations to be had after today. Um, Sam and I will share all of this with you by email, but please do reach out to us for questions or if you want us to link you up with anyone in this forum, we can provide that support as well. Um, but let's um, continue with this drive to really help support subcatchment partnerships to deliver all of this great work and to work together within Cameo to um, get all of this success celebrated and known about and shared with CABA and, and other frameworks. So um, Sam, I don't know if you have any final words to add, add to that. Thanks, Jesse. No, just to, just to echo your thoughts, it's been it's been a long while in the making, this conference, um, and I mentioned yesterday that we'd got away without any technical glitches, but we've got a full array of the beauty of a virtual conference today, but I think it just adds to the character, personally. Um, but no, thank you all for coming. It's been great that we've been able to share this with so many people. Um, we've had well over 50 participants throughout both days, so um, that's really great, and we just look forward to moving forward and driving forward all of this excellent work within Cameo. So just echoing your thanks. Great, thank you all. It's strange not to see all your faces to say goodbye, but here, here they are from me. So see you all soon. <laughs>